All of us at one time or another have set some kind of New Year's resolution or promise to ourselves that we're going to start praying. We, we know it's something that uh, a good Christian needs to do, and we're going to write it down on our to-do list. We're going to block out some time, and, and we do all of those things that the experts tell us we should do to have a good and effective prayer time. And no matter what time you have set aside for your prayer time, that's the time that people who have not talked to you in 20 years call. Uh, that's the time when that air conditioning starts making that funny sound that you can't ignore. Your children will need your attention in ways they have never needed your attention before. For some reason, you will not be able to pray. It's as if the world has some kind of conspiracy against giving you and me the time that we need to spend time in prayer. And then when you start praying, you don't know if it really works. You really wish God would give you a high five, pat you on the head, something, to let you know, yes, Mike, that was a good prayer. I'll see you tomorrow. Something like that, but nothing. And in fact, sometimes you wonder if it does uh, any good at all. So if we start, we don't stay. But we can't quite give up on it. So we'll start again. And the reasons we don't give up on it is we know that, well, everything that started before has started when some people were praying. Uh, the walls of Jericho fell down after seven days of worship and prayer. Uh, the Philippian jail opened as Saul and as Paul and Silas were praying and worshiping. Uh, the whole book of Revelation is a book of prayer and worship. And I was in the Lord, I, it was the Lord's day. I was on the island of Patmos. I was in the Spirit. John begins the book. And we have the, the glorious revealing that John was privileged to see and record for us. All that kind of happened in prayer. It all starts when we start praying which may be why we are so hesitant to start at all. Hannah prayed. Zechariah prayed. And we're going to talk about what happened when these two people in the story of Jesus prayed. Hannah, the story is told in the first chapter of 1 Samuel. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. We'll begin in the middle of the story, verse 12. Now, while she was praying in the Lord's presence, Eli was watching her lips. Hannah was speaking to herself, and although her lips were moving and no voice could be heard, Eli thought she was drunk and scolded her. How long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine, he said. No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I'm not a I, but I'm a woman with a broken heart. I have not had wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord, and don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. And Eli responded, go in peace now, and may the God of Israel grant the petition that you have requested from him. May your servant find favor with you, she replied. And then Hannah went on her way, and she ate, and no longer appeared downcast. And the next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to bow to, and worship to the Lord. Afterwards, they returned home to Ramah. There Elkanah was intimate with his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And after some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, because she said, I requested him from the Lord. When Elkanah and all of his household went up to make the annual sacrifice and a vow offering to the Lord, Hannah did not go and explain to her husband, after the child is weaned, I will take him there to appear in the Lord's presence and to stay there permanently. And her husband Elkanah replied, do what you think is best, and stay here until you have weaned him. May the Lord confirm his word in you. So Hannah stayed there and nursed her son until he, he, she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took, with her, he, took him with her to Shiloh. And she took with her a three-year-old bull, two and a half gallons of flour, and a jar of wine. And the boy was still young. She took him to the Lord's house at Shiloh. There they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. Please, my Lord, she said, as, as you live... My Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this very boy. And since the Lord gave me what I asked for, I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. And there he bowed, and he worshiped the Lord there together. This is God's word for God's people. 
Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Father, as Hannah prayed, as Zechariah prayed, as, as they caught hold of what you were doing in the world, we pray, Father, like them, we too will be able to trust you with our deepest pains and our deepest joys to join you in your saving work. We pray this in your name. Amen. Sometimes there's nothing left to do but pray. Sometimes the situation has gotten to a place where you can't fix it. Uh, you can't figure it out. Uh, there's nobody else to call. You don't know how it's going to turn out. And there's really nothing you can do about it. So you pray. And, and it's funny in times like these that people who don't even believe in prayer will all of a sudden ask you to pray for them. You'll go to the hospital to visit a colleague, a friend. Uh, they'll be in a desperate situation, and all of a sudden they will grab your hand and say, will you pray for me? And you've never known this person to pray. In fact, you've only known this person to speak the name of Jesus when they were using it as an expression of profanity. And yet now they want you to pray. I'm more and more convinced that sometimes when people do that, use the name of the Lord in vain, in profanity, that it is kind of a backward kind of challenge that in their heart of hearts, they're really hoping that somehow Jesus would show up when they called him like that, and that he would be there to fix things that they know were terribly, terribly wrong. Sometimes there's nothing left to do but pray, and you try to pray, and then there are no words to pray the what you want to pray. The burden is too big, the hurt too deep. And there are no words that can tell God how deeply you hurt. It's one of those times when, when we trust the words of Romans 8 that we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit of God that searches the deep things of God Himself, searches the deep things of us, and makes those prayers and petitions known to the Father's heart. We trust those words and we hold on to those words because honestly, sometimes we don't know how to pray. Sometimes the words are only, Oh God, please Jesus know. Or just help. Hannah had been pushed beyond everything she could bear. She could have no children. Now, while we read that as 21st century North Americans, we kind of, well, that, that, that's bad, but, but surely there's no, this was desperate for Hannah. There was no social security system. There was no retire, there were no retirement funds. If Elkanah died, if Elkanah died, and more than likely he would before she did, then she would have to trust her children to take care of her in her old age. Remember in the story of Ruth, the Old Testament story uh, of, of Naomi, her husband dies, she is dependent on her two daughter-in-laws to take care of her. And they're not obligated to do so. She's no blood kin to them. She, they're not obligated to do so, but Ruth does take care of Naomi. Hannah had no one to take care of her. Not only did she not have a child, which was seen as a blessing of the Lord, she had no future. And if something happened to her husband, she'd be on her own. Now, not only did she not have a child, not only did she know that she was on her own, all of her friends around her didn't get it. Or if they did get it, they didn't help her. Uh, for instance, the other wives of Elkanah, it wasn't unusual in those times for a man to have more than one wife. They had children, and they would do helpful things like let Hannah babysit and remind her any way they could that they were blessed and she was not. And of course, Elkanah, sensitive, loving husband that he is, says to his wife when she tells him of her concern, am I not worth 10 sons to you? <laughs> you see, that's my problem with evolution. Guys, we just haven't evolved that much. Some of you right now are going, well, yeah, that's what he said. What's wrong with that? Your wife will explain to you what's wrong when you go home. <laughs> Hannah had no choice. God had to do something. He had to do something in a hurry. And she was praying so hard. 
uh, maybe even lying prostrate in, 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 in the tabernacle, maybe even swaying back and forth, trying to get God to hear what she was saying. Eli had seen this before, but he'd seen it by people who came to the sacrifice with a whole bunch of wine and drank too much. And he just finally had had the last thing he could take, and he scolded Hannah. How long are you going to stand here and drink? Stop drinking. Get out of here. And when she confesses to him that she was praying from the depths of her souls, then, El, then, then Eli is apologetic. He, I'm sorry, I, he hadn't seen that in a long time. If he had seen it at all, he just assumed that anybody praying like that must be intoxicated. They surely could not be in that de deep of prayer. You see, Eli had kind of given up too. Little did he know that the answer to his prayer was standing in front of him because the son that this woman would bring into the world, Samuel, would take Eli's place, would follow Eli as the great high priest. Not Eli's sons who were known to be corrupt and immoral. No, they would be taken out of the line and Eli himself would die and it would become Samuel's role to be the high priest. And Eli is so moved that he says to her, I really hope God hears your prayer. Don't you wish Eli had said something more profound than that? Don't you wish Eli had, had the confidence to say, ma'am, I've seen people pray. You're the kind of prayer that moves the heart of God. This kind of broken-hearted, desperate prayer is what really gets God's attention. I know he'll answer your prayer, but he doesn't. Frankly, he hadn't seen this in a long time. I don't know that he really knew what to do. And lo and behold, a few years later, this woman comes back with a little boy. God had heard Hannah's prayer, and Samuel was born. And he couldn't have been much older than first grade, maybe even a kindergarten age for us, but he wasn't very old at all when she brought him to live in the tabernacle. And there Samuel would be trained by Eli, uh, Eli and there... Uh, Samuel would learn and watch how God worked and how God moved. And how, in fact, one night when he was sleeping, God called Samuel, and, and Samuel thought it was Eli. So he got up a couple of times before Eli finally re realized, wait a minute, I'm not calling you. You keep waking me up, but I'm not calling you. And finally it hits Eli. Wow, must be God. Maybe Eli remembered the time that God had talked to him in such a way. Samuel, here is how you listen to God. Here is what you say in response. One of the important roles of senior adults, one of the important roles of mature Christians is to circle back and get into the lives of young adults, young people. Because now, with the brokenness of the family, too many young adults, young people are growing up without mature believers watching their lives, praying for them. Without that kind of counsel, young people don't know how to recognize the presence of God. Amen. So it takes somebody with a little gray in the beard, a little mileage on them to say, wait a minute, did you not see this? Did you not pay attention to this? That was God in your life. Did you not listen to this? That's how God speaks to you. You need to pay attention here. One of the things that young adults desperately need are Eli's. Now, I know we give Eli a hard time, but he was the one who taught Samuel how to listen to God. Amen. One of the things our senior adults have to do is circle back in the lives of these young adults become Eli to them. It is Samuel who does hear the word of the Lord later and anoints the new king David through whom God will fulfill all of his promises to Abraham and Israel will become a nation, city of Jerusalem will be founded and David will be the greatest king in the history of Israel and it will be Samuel who will have found him. Samuel, this little bitty prayer, this little bitty prayer for nothing more than a baby now becomes this great big answer. Sometimes little bitty prayers have great big answers. 
You see, one of the things that, that theologians talk about all the time is his salvation history. Salvation history is this great plan of God to, to bring about salvation to humanity. And, and it started uh, at the beginning of time. Well, it started before the beginning of time. And God is always working across history, across time, to bring about the completion of his promises. And he looks for those openings. He looks for those moments. He looks for those hearts that will give him access into our world. And so Hannah steps up and says, more than anything, I want a child. And if you'll give me a child, if you'll give me a son, I promise I will give him back to you. So God, working this great salvation story, says, ah, I'll start with Hannah. I'll start with Samuel. I'll start with a child. And I'll bring my promise true to Abraham. Sometimes little bitty prayers have great big answers. And sometimes great big prayers have little bitty answers. Zechariah had a great big prayer. His story is found in the first chapter of Luke. Verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest in Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth could not conceive, and both of them were well along in years. Now when the division was on duty, and he was serving as a priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense." At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside, and an angel of the Lord appeared to Zacharias, standing at the right of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was startled and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, too late. Anytime the angel tells you not to be afraid, it's too late. Do not be afraid because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear your son and his name will be John. There will be joy and delight for you. And many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn away, he will turn many of the sons of Israel to their Lord their God. He will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and, disobe and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. Well, how can I know this? Zacharias asked the angel, for I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I speak to you and, t and I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Now listen, you will become silent and un unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled at their proper time. Just a little hint from Uncle Mike, just me to you. Anytime Gabriel tells you something, do not look back at him and say, prove it. <laughs> it gets on his last nerve. Now notice what Gabriel does. When Zechariah says, how can this be? I'm an old man, my wife is an old woman. There is no way. Gabriel, he almost gives him the boy look. You all know the boy look, right? The state troopers in Alabama have this look. They'll turn their heads sideways and squint their eyes and say, boy, do you know how fast you were going? You'll agree to whatever he says after that. Yeah, I was going that way. Boy, he almost gave, Gabriel almost gives Zachariah the boy. Do you know who I am? I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. He sent me to tell you this. This is what you and Elizabeth have been praying for. I'm here to tell you your prayer is answered. And you say, prove it. Here's your proof. Because you did not believe, you will not speak. Some of you wonder why you don't have a great evangelism story. Or when the, come time, the time comes for you to share what you know about Jesus, the words are never there. If you don't believe, you can't speak. Gabriel took from Zechariah the one thing that every pastor dreads more than anything. Zechariah lost his voice. 
Now, can you imagine? For nine months, he can't say a word. Not a word. The women come up and tell him, oh, Zachariah, we saw Elizabeth. She's beautiful. She's just glowing. And he can't say anything. His boys come around and elbow him in the ribs and go, how about it, old boy? <laughs> and he can't say anything. Boy, you talk about hell on earth. Zachariah walked through it. No, no, no. If you don't believe me, fine. Then you won't say a word till it happens. Then you can name him John. And then you'll watch and see what happens. See, this great big prayer, because this was the time when, when Zacharias would have been praying for the salvation of Israel. Will you at long last come again? Will you at long last send us a salvation? Will you at long last come and set us free? Get us out of, out of Rome's tyranny like you did when you sent Moses to Egypt. Will you at long last save your people? And this great big prayer gets a little bitty answer where God says to Zechariah, yes, I will. And I'm going to use your son to do it. And it was John who was the original Mr. Fixing to Get Ready. Jesus is coming. You need to get ready. Why? Because the time comes when you don't have time to get ready. You have to be ready. And I'm not sure that some of us do not understand more than we know. That we do not believe at deeper levels than we say. And I'm wondering if this is why we clutter up Christmas the way we do. And we'll complain about how we have commercialized Christmas and how, how it's just insane the pressure we put on everybody while we're standing in line at the mall. We'll buy presents for people that we don't even see during the year. And you have to do that Christmas algebra. You know what I'm talking about, right? This person gave you a present. Uh-oh. I have to give them a present. But now I've got to figure out how much that present cost that they gave to me. Because there's a certain percentage that you cannot be below. Oh, no, that's an insult. Or above. See, that's bragging if you give back more. See, now, now you have created a Christmas gift crisis if you don't respond appropriately. We will, we will drive hundreds of miles, wait in line at airports to be with people in December that we would never hang around with in June. <laughs> hey, just tweeting me and you, just keeping it real here. Got to go home, got to get it. Why? I, I don't know. Some law somewhere, right? And for some of you, it's not Christmas unless you're about half miserable. And I'm not so sure that the reason we do this is not, is, is, is not because we don't believe. On the contrary, I think it is because we do believe. I think it is because we do know. I think if we know, if we start praying even just the smallest prayer that Jesus may answer, and if Jesus answers, he's going to turn the world right side up. Uh -uh. See, we always tell, say, Jesus is going to come turn the world right uh, upside down. We've already done that. Okay. Uh, we, we live in a world where we pay athletes millions and millions of dollars. Okay? We pay teachers not quite that. Okay? That's upside down. Okay? Uh, that's just one little evidence of an, of an upside down world. You see, Jesus is going to come and turn it right side up. And that's what frightens us. What happens if we who have grown used to living in an upside-down world all of a sudden have to make this adjustment of living in a world right side up? You see, a lot of the things that we want make sense in an upside-down world, but they don't make any sense in a world that's right side up. See, a lot of the things that we are working for, driving for, a lot of the things that we think to ourselves, we have to have this, make sense in an upside-down world. But they don't make sense in a world that's right side up. So we'll stay too busy. We'll have dinner with friends. We'll spend way too much money on gifts. 
and we'll complain about it in January, but our number one goal will have been achieved and we will have pushed ourselves past the point of conversation with Jesus. Jesus will come and we'll be at the mall. So what happens when this child comes and turns your world right side up? Honestly, it's not what we want for Christmas, is it? Well, that brings us to a hard question. What is it that you really want? And how much trouble would you be in if you got it? Prayer's where it all starts. This desperate prayer when we know that the situation we're in, only God can answer. The sooner you realize that, the faster you'll pray. The faster you pray, the faster he'll answer.